To our next panel, it's led by Ty. It's nice to see the head of Ty, AGK, sitting right here in the front row. This is going to be a panel discussion on cross-border investments. We have time to ask questions at the end. To introduce this panel is incoming Ty President, Anita Manwani. Thank you, Margaret, and thank you, Asia Society, India Spora, and we really are grateful for this opportunity to participate in Naren's, celebrating Naren's legacy. Although you've all heard so much about Naren's rich and contributing life, I don't think that I can start this without sharing my own personal experience as I watched a new Naren over several years. For me, Naren was not just a technology giant or an intellectual giant or a business giant, but he was a man who had so many varied interests and he took everything with so much passion and excelled at everything he did. And most importantly, he was so humble. I have never seen a frown on Naren's face, no matter how serious the subject. He was so curious, he always made you feel like he was listening to you and he was keenly interested in hearing about everybody's opinion, whether it was about education, the state of the country, what's happening in the US, what do you think about a philosophical subject. And I feel so fortunate that I was part of many of those intimate dinner conversations. So Naren, thank you, and thank you all for being here to celebrate his life. Many of us were touched positively by Naren, but most of all, he touched so many entrepreneurs across the world, both in Silicon Valley and in India and in many other countries. I feel that we've had so, we have so much to do and we've already heard about uh, the show of friendship from Tanvi. And today I want to extend to Asia Society a show of friendship from Thai Silicon Valley, because I think there are a lot of opportunities to collaborate, to kind of uh, have discussions about how we can influence trade policies, to collaborate on how we can have joint investments and also joint technology explorations. Thai Silicon Valley, as you know, Thai is the Thai Silicon Valley is the founding chapter. We are celebrating our thirtieth year this year. And I feel very honored that I have become Thai's first president-elect, who is a woman. So, uh, but my commitment to diversity is really beyond gender. I really want Thai Silicon Valley to become very much part of what Silicon Valley represents. It represents all of you in the room. It represents all of Asia. It represents the non-Asian communities. And that's what we want to bring together in Thai's mission for really fostering entrepreneurship. We do this in a variety of ways. We have mentoring programs. We have university Thai youth. We have Thai university where we offer many MBAs. We have lots of networking uh, opportunities, boot camps for entrepreneurs. And most importantly, we have throughout the year engagements that do deep dives into emerging technologies and then our flagship conference, which is TICON. And we had a phenomenal conference this year looking at emerging issues like supply chain. You've heard uh, then we talk about an interest in that. Healthcare continues to be an important issue in this post-pandemic world. So, um, but you know, with all the buzz that is going on in the markets and in geopolitical issues, today's topic is very relevant. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. First, we have Venk Shukla. Venk needs no introduction to this community because he has been a past Thai president. He has been the chair of Thai Global. He's also the founding Part, partner and has founded Montevista Capital, a seed investment firm. And Venk, as everyone here seems to have a lot of interest in social impact. Venk's social impact is that he was the founding president of FFE, which is Foundation for Excellence that gives scholarships to students in India for professional development and pursuing degrees in medicine and engineering. 
To Wenk's side is Kumar Ganpati, again a stalwart in the semiconductor industry. Kumar holds more than 75 patents. He has been an entrepreneur, sold his companies to big giants like Western Digital, and he is the founder of 3i Partners, also focused on entrepreneurs for social impact, and that focuses primarily around agriculture, education, and healthcare. And then we have Satya Bajpai, who is the MD of Citizens Bank, with a market cap and an invest, uh, asset management of $200 billion. Satya himself has made an impact of more than $100 billion across transactions in US, Europe, and Asia. He's also a adjunct professor at Rice University, an IIT alum, and brings a wealth of experience from his previous jobs at Credit Suisse and Deloitte. And last but not the least, my dear friend, Priya Rajan, Managing Director at Silicon Valley Bank. Priya has done so many things for the community. I don't know where I can begin, but Women Who Code is dear to my heart, as well as boys and girls. So, um, and Priya manages and leads the investment opportunities and supporting entrepreneurs in the India corridor, but also in South Asia. So over to you, Priya, to give us a great start to this panel. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Anita. Thank you for all those kind words. And really excited for the panel today. I think we have some incredible people. Uh, we're going to try to keep it uh, conversational as well. So we're going to go with like about 40 minutes to 45 uh, of a panel discussion. And please feel free to ask questions uh, and have your questions ready. And we'll, we'll call you out at the end. Um, Anita did a great job of in, you know, uh, introducing all of you, but I do want to give you another quick round, almost like Twitter style. If you can talk about specifically today, the highlight is about the India-US kind of investments. So from that lens, can, if you can highlight kind of what you do and your role within that corridor. Thank we'll just talk to you. From investment in India? That's right, cross-border investments. Cross-border, okay. <clears throat> You know, I've been uh, intimately involved, you see, with uh, developing the policy, helping develop the policy framework for, uh, for startups and startups investment in India. And just for that reason, you see, I've avoided, because I deal a lot with the central government and with different state governments in India, I have, for that reason, I have uh, studiously avoided, you see, making any investment less the bureaucracy there, and bureaucracy in India is very, very prickly. Unless they think that there's a, there's a personal agenda that I'm advancing. So I've, I've actually lost out on a lot of very good opportunities that I should have invested in, but I did not, because I take my other work, you see, very, very seriously. Uh, so having said that, uh, you know, I think during the course of the discussion, is I can throw more light, you see, on some of the trends that I see there going forward. Absolutely. We'll dive in a bit, uh, a bit later as well. Um, Kumar, how about you? Thanks, Priya. Um, nice to meet you all. Nice to be here. Um, I don't have too many Narain stories, but I've met him once or twice. You know, all I remember is warmth and humility and true mentorship. Okay. So, thank you. Um, just, just my background is just a tech entrepreneur, you know, boring tech entrepreneur for the last 20 plus years, built a bunch of companies, um, made, made some money for investors, you know, uh, but in general, all of my companies um, have focused on building, you know, U.S. markets, U.S. teams, and U.S. capital. So in the last two years, um, or a little over two years, I've been on this journey to figure out, you know, where are the next big opportunities? Where can we find um, some purpose together with some investment and profit? And we've landed on an interesting experiment, I would call it still. It's, it's, a, it's an investment vehicle called 3i Partners. Um, you know, about 15, 20 of the tech entrepreneurs here in the Bay Area who are Indian origin who want to give back. Um, we invest in early stage impact companies across agriculture, education, um, healthcare, and livelihood. Um, we are looking at really creating the next opportunities for the next billion, which is people who make between two to five thousand dollars per year, one and a half lakhs or so. Um, very large, you know, uh, employment opportunities for the middle class or the emerging middle class, and I believe that drives home, uh, you know, the ability to make a lot of return together with a lot of purpose and 
uh, you know, growth in that sector. So that's, that's kind of what I'm up to. Thank you. And social entrepreneurship in the India-U.S. cross-border, it doesn't get talked about quite a bit. So I'd love to deep dive into that as well. Uh, Satya, how about you? Yeah, I think from my perspective, I think what Vank and Kumar said are, makes sense. But what I see is some of the numbers. Mm -hmm. And what you find is right now, if you look at companies out of India, India is number three in, in terms of unicorns. And unicorn is Nowadays, a common term in the U.S., but from an India perspective, it's a, it's a sizable number and sizable increase in that number over the last two years. And that ramp up is pretty steep, and that highlights how important a role uh, diversified. So I'm not saying India, I'm saying in the outside U.S., companies and countries will play, and Israel being one of them, China being one of them, and then India is the third. And these three regions will play a very important role in future as uh, the technology ecosystem grows. Great, thank you. And uh, as you are investing in companies and mentoring the companies, what are some of the disruptive innovations that you're starting to emerge uh, that you see has, is going to have a long-term impact on that India-US kind of cross-border uh, landscape? Then we'll start with you. Yeah. You know, so there, if you look at uh, all the startups in India, you can see that uh, a lot of them have global ambitions, uh, especially in the B2B space. And the reason for that is simple. India, for all its success, is only about 3 to 5% of the global economy. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have to go global. And if you're thinking of going global, uh, there is no choice but to, in most cases, to start with U.S., uh, U.S. is, you know, a significant part of the global economy. But beyond that, it has a very, very critical role. Lots of countries in the world, a lot of companies in the outside of U.S. look for adoption in U.S. as an endorsement of the technology, endorsement of the business model before they will adopt. Uh, your, your hopes of selling something from India into Japan or Korea or, or any of these countries is, is next to zero. But if you had uh, customers in, in U.S., then that success could translate into success elsewhere. So succeeding in U.S. is extremely critical to, uh, to Indian uh, startups that, want, that have global ambition. Now, there are three kinds of those kind of startups. Uh, Anyone that has become a unicorn, as they said, they have the resources, they can hire the right people, they can engage the right partners, they can do all of those kind of things here. Mm -hmm. uh, the companies that have just starting out less than one million in revenue, I mean, it's a fantasy for them. It's not, I mean, it's, it, you know, they, it's a dream and fantasy is not, a, there's not something they can do about it. But the most interesting ones are the ones that have the revenues in the range of, let's say, one million to 10 million is the annual revenue. They are the ones, you see, who have experienced success in the domestic market or in the immediate market. So they have the credibility, they have the potential, but they don't have the resources. And that's where, uh, that's where Silicon Valley and the rest of U.S., the diaspora, as well as the VCs, as well as uh, the partners, channel partners, stuff, have a very, very critical role to play. And we can discuss more. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Bank. Yeah, so um, when we look at this, we look at it slightly differently. We are, we are looking for social entrepreneurs. You know, um, you guys know in the last 10 plus years, a lot more of the immigration has slowed down from India. So the best and brightest are staying back. They're building companies. Entrepreneurship is uh, cool. It's a way of life. Uh, everybody understands it. 250 plus incubators every year get started in India. Okay, so... 10,000 startups or 20,000 startups a year get funded. So the, the numbers are staggering. Okay? Um, a lot of them um, focus on the top 50 million in our minds of you know, the, the Flipkarts, the Swiggies, and, and uh, a lot of them get funded by global venture capitalists to either go after the top of the pyramid or go after global markets, which is, you know, there's a company called Freshworks that went public for those of you building Indian SaaS companies at a you know, $5, $10 billion scale. Uh, all sitting out of India trying to figure out how to crack the, the go-to-market in the U.S. Uh, with the new age tools, digital marketing and digital you know, sales tools, they are able to do it with you know, time and distances across this. What 
what we are looking at is really how do we find the, the smartest and the aspiring entrepreneurs to go after the India's, India's problems and really go after, you know, Indian agriculture, for instance, is a $250 billion per year market, completely, you know, more or less unorganized, getting completely disrupted today, okay? Um, very high returns. We see companies who are doing, you know, a million dollars per year growing three to 400 percent a year over year while serving that target segment, you know, in a systematic way, formalizing data, formalizing connections, you know, market linkage, eliminating and providing export-oriented opportunities for, you know, um, the, the agriculture, the textile segment, and so on and so forth, while creating jobs and growing it profitably. So very bullish on these opportunities, how you take informal sectors and formalize them with data and tools and apps, and be able to connect them to global demand sitting in India. Thank you, thank you, Satya. And uh, if you look at the sectors, to answer your question, if you look at the sectors where the investment is going, historically, last two, three years, the biggest growth has been in D2C, mm -hmm. so direct to customer. Uh, second being B2B, mark, uh, B2B sort of customers. Interestingly, a big part of entrepreneurial push in India is coming on the payments and crypto as well. And we have seen 300% plus increase in number of entrepreneurs or number of Series A or early stage companies being funded. And that's a pretty good trend for three years later. What we see is, oh, $100 million deal happened, but that's more... Four years, five years back, they started, and now they are sort of doing Series C, Series D. What you will find is next two to three years, you'll find more of these payments, crypto, uh, and also online marketplaces. It's interesting to see that trend because uh, India, it's a great online marketplace, but still a very small percent of the global economy. But, uh, and China has done this before. India trying to sort of build marketplaces in India and then transporting it or expanding it to other geographies. That'll be interesting to see, but that's another area that's growing very fast. Uh, and, uh, you know, with investors on the room, on the table, we can not miss ask the question about valuation and what the current markets are doing. It's, n it was, it's not as hot as it was a year and a half ago. And uh, what do you guys see in terms of, like, uh, market? Is it – what's the – what's your prediction in, in terms of what's going to happen in the next year, year and a half? And do you see it come back to where it was? And what, what is the new normal going to be? Any predictions would be great to highlight, especially with the U.S.-India lens. You know, I think uh, uh, 70 to 80 percent of investment in India in startups uh, comes from global uh, investors. Right. And global investors are especially those late stage, growth stage investors. Those are the ones who are responsible for turning a company into a unicorn. Mm -hmm. They are all holding back. So it will have, it will have, you see, a, you know, a cooling effect, uh, you know, just as it has happened here. It will happen even more in India mm -hmm. because uh, overwhelming majority of the investment is from outside and a lot of it is from U.S. Mm -hmm. and, and just to follow on, do you see that kind of have an impact on the early stage or is it more the growth, growth stage and beyond? Yeah, I think seed stage, I think there's a very little impact on this. Uh, seed stage valuations are in any case low, and I was surprised how low they are in India, even today. Uh, so seed stage investments, as see valuations were low. I don't think it will have much of an impact. But uh, Series B, Series C, Series D, that's where, see, it will be a, you know, it will be a, a huge challenge for people to, to grow the kind of valuations they did in last two couple, in last couple of years. That's right. Yep, that's true. Kumar and Satya, any thoughts on yeah, that? Go ahead. Go ahead. I think uh, from my perspective, I actually have a slightly different opinion on this. And the reason for that is if you peel the onion on what's happening in the economy, there is still to find a big structural issue. There are multiple things like supply chain, the, uh, the Russia uh, situation, and also uh, so the government easing and has created an inflationary environment. But really, there's no major structural issue like was the case in previous uh, economic downturns. And the second thing which is also important here is, if you remember, there was an inflow, outflow of money from U.S., an inflow of money to BRIC countries. And that BRIC is broken now because uh, you have Brazil, people are not sure about economic situations there. Russia, a lot of money has frozen there. China, it's 
iffy in terms of how much money you can transfer from U.S. to China because now every transaction is looked at. So India becomes one of the only options of the international pool of capital to go out to. So what I expect is as the dust settles over time, you'll find the investments going to India will be higher. There's another reason for that. There's a lot of companies that have sort of matured into Series B or C in last uh, five years in, from India. They will be really good exits, and most of them will be M&A exits, frankly, actually, than uh, versus IPO. And that will create a positive environment around sort of companies that are coming out of India. And I expect that maybe not this year, but starting next year, you'll find much bigger investments going out of uh, U.S. to India. That's great. That's I, I don't have much more to add. Yeah. These guys are much closer <laughs> to the ball here. But I, the net net is I think the valuations are going to correct. Right. Uh, private markets lag by six to nine months. Mm -hmm. And the signs are there. The, the deal momentum is slowing down. But how soft will it become, time will take. That's right. Time will tell, right? Um, I think uh, just a question for you specifically. Uh, Anita, when she did the intro, she talked a lot about how organizations such as Thai uh, does a lot to foster kind of community engagement. Um, to take a step back, India Diaspora community, if you look at it, I mean, we're dominating uh, kind of the innovation ecosystem here, whether it be it, it's the top CEOs and CXOs and top companies or in the venture or startup ecosystem. Uh, and a lot of huge kudos to organizations such as Thai and and MR is there in diaspora for, for bringing the community together and kind of fostering the next set of leaders. How do you, uh, if you can share some of the insights, both from a personal standpoint, I know you're involved in specific startup council that are done by government that you are part of and you provide insights, and also out of Thai, what are some of the initiatives that you guys are doing that fosters this growth of these unicorns uh, or, you know, and, and more investments into India? So about four or five years ago, Thai launched, Thai Silicon Valley launched a, a program that we called Billion Dollar Babies, mm -hmm. in which we uh, basically selected four high potential startups from India. And the, and the thesis was that, uh, that if we apply the Silicon Valley muscle to these companies, uh, we'll be able to accelerate their global success. And uh, so out of the four companies that we selected, uh, one of them became a unicorn. Uh, two others received, uh, one others had an exit, and uh, two had an exit, and a third one is just raised to Series C or Series D. So, so in all those four cases, the, the, this close involvement of Thai Silicon Valley mentors, high impact mentors with those companies, resulted you see, in a significant success. So we're trying to now roll it out on a much bigger scale. And uh, we have proposed to the government of India also to, for them to get involved, where, where, we, where we pick those companies, we pick some of those companies on a much larger scale and apply the, the Thai uh, expertise in identifying appropriate mentors for those companies. Uh, some companies need help in scaling sales. Some people need help in terms of go to market. Some people need help in terms of scaling the engineering organization. Uh, on and on and on. Each company is unique, and the help they need is unique. So, the, so one of the things that we are proposing, you see, to the government of India, is for them to get involved in that process because the scale is a lot bigger, and uh, Thai AC will put its resources in identifying the right experts, the right domain leaders. To work for these companies. Thank you. Thank you, Vank, for all the efforts that Thai and uh, in diaspora does to foster these ecosystem connects. Uh, Satya or um, Kumar, sorry, uh, question for you just coming back to social entrepreneurship. Again, this is a topic that personally I don't hear. I oversee the India market uh, for Silicon Valley Bank and not much of innovation that we see come to our table on the social entrepreneurship side. And really great to hear because we need more of those. So how do you work with the companies to make it as exciting as a, another SaaS deal that comes to the table that has much, a, much like 10x or 100x kind of profitability model versus this may not show up early on. How do you, how do you make it comparable investable opportunity? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, uh, <coughs> our, our lens is really looking at 
is there intentional impact in these companies that drives one of our clear metrics across, you know, um, livelihood or incomes for farmers or specific job creations, and we quantify these metrics in some way. We look for companies that have that uh, ability to grow the business while improving the metrics simultaneously. Right. Okay. Um, so I'll kind of give you one or two examples of these companies, right, that maybe gives you a better sense of it. You know, um, in Indian Ag today, uh, the trust, the farmers, the, there's 130 million small and medium scale farmers, and improving, you know, they make two to $5,000 per year, and how do you really improve that? And the demand is excessive. I mean, there's a company called Dihart, if you guys know, in the last five years, they've become a unicorn. Mm -hmm. Uh, built about a million farmers in their network and provided systematic linkage to their outputs and inputs. And it, it's, a, it's a very simple concept, and how do you really build networks of these underrepresented communities in India and really create ability to create high trust networks to them? So in our thesis, we look for those. So we have, we have invested in a company called Centre, which is building similar networks around teachers now. So education in India is highly valued. In, and intervention happens student at a time. When we improve the quality of the teachers, it, it scales by a factor of 40, 50, 50 simultaneously. So these guys have come up with an interesting business model for professional development, recruiting, and placement of teachers has almost a million teacher community that they are dealing with and interacting with to build these kinds of next generation companies. Uh, so there are models out there. They are a little bit harder than traditional D to C or B to B. But uh, I think they'll be a lot more valuable for investors and a lot more satisfied. Great, thank you. Uh, just final closing thoughts, and we'll open it up for question. Uh, for the folks who are here, uh, either as investors and advising the portfolio companies or startups listening, what are some of the thoughts that you would have to best position them? Because we're talking about investments in this panel. How can they best position themselves to attract the right investor? That's an age-old problem. <laughs> you probably don't have a right answer for any, uh, any company because every company is so different. But I really feel, uh, to Wang's point before, uh, what he said is a lot of companies are looking to, to U.S. as a validation and hence having um, connections with, in, within U.S., which could be, which doesn't have to be capital. It can be advisors. It can be people who have done business or made businesses successful here. Having those connections are really important. I'm encouraging a lot of my clients who are uh, late-stage companies to spend a lot of time in U.S., come to U.S. And, and meet all the investors, and we just arrange back-to-back -back meetings for them so that they can spend more time with the investors here and sometimes senior executives of other companies who are interested in knowing or helping those companies. You know, uh, it's an unfortunate reality, and India probably won't like to hear this, but if you want to attract, if you're an Indian startup, you want to attract uh, investors, uh, you have to incorporate outside of India. It's, a, it's an unfortunate reality. And I remember, you see, when we were doing the billion dollar babies rollout in Bangalore, I, you know, I was talking about them and I said, you know, this is, and this will help keep the companies in India. And one person stood up, one entrepreneur, he says, Venk, you are flogging a dead horse yep. and the train has already left the station. Mm -hmm. Please don't waste any time on that. Right. This is five years ago. And unfortunately, uh, you know, the things continue. Yeah. Uh, you know, startup after startup after startup feels compelled to incorporate in Singapore or Delaware if they want to continue to attract, to say, foreign investors. And if you do incorporate in Delaware, ping me, we'll talk offline. <laughs> Have to do that pitch, right? <laughs> Kumar. I think Wink is unfortunately right. So uh, It's hard to argue with the facts that you had to flip the, flip the company outside India for global investor sentiment to pick up. But it's uh, not as pessimistic, I feel, you know, going forward. I think um, things have changed. Uh, I'm a direct investor, foreign direct investor in a bunch of these companies. Um, it's moving faster. Uh, we haven't hit exits yet, so I don't know all the issues around that. But That's when you will know. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. We'll open it up for questions. Go ahead. Please introduce yourself and your question. I am Srikant Silin, uh, entrepreneur, uh, retired, <laughs> still trying. Um, 
there seems to be quite a bit of ambiguity on the energy sector in India. On the one hand, we see a lot, huge number of startups. Then we see a, a lot of statistics saying a lot of states and government, there is a massive shortage. So can you throw some light on that? I can start. Uh, I can start on this, and then obviously Kumar and Ben can add. Uh, uh, energy sector in India is highly regulated, like in any other country, but in India, especially with the bureaucracy and everything, it is a slow-moving animal, and it will always be slow-moving. So uh, that restricts, from an investor perspective, what I've seen, like I'm telling you what like I hear from investors, and what they're saying is, this is not a sector if I have to pick five companies uh, in India only. I, this is a sector I'm going to shy away from just because of the pace at which it can move unless it's a company which has international application. So if the product can be applied internationally and I can pull strings to get them in U.S. or in Europe, then it's an amazing investment. But if it's all India only, then an investor in U.S., may not be as excited. But within India, if you can win that, it's a very big market, as you said, and, uh, but it's still bureaucratic. Right. Any, any other question? Go ahead, Rajiv. Hi, my name is Rajiv. Uh, I wanted to just dig a little deeper into this uh, investor sentiment from uh, you know, US or other entities to invest in India. Can you, is it an IP protection, or is it something re related to the regulatory? things because I've seen myself, you know, a couple of companies I was helping, they all came over here. In fact, I started one with a Silicon Valley Bank, just to put your plug a little so bit. So I'll give you a quick uh, sort of uh, bullet point thing, but if you want to know the detail, right. the guy here is, uh, you know, from Nishit Desai Associate, Meher, uh, talk to him, he will he'll spend, he'll spend, he'll spend a day with you on that one. <laughs> but but let, me just give, let me just give you a... <laughs> Let me just give you a two, three quick bullet points. Uh, if, you are, if you are headquartered in India and you have subsidiaries all over the world, which you need to if you're hiring or selling things, movement of money back and forth is incredibly complicated because of FERA regulations. It's very easy to be any of this thing default and you would be liable for criminal prosecution. So that's one thing. The second thing is just the how, uh, how you get, you know, the employee stock options and how it gets treated. Uh, the whole bunch of these things in, you know, uh, procedures, simple procedures like raising next round of, of money, you have to have three separate board meetings. One to approve that you need to have, uh, have an extra share. Then the second one is that you actually find a, 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 a investor. Then you have another board meeting. And the third board meeting is to actually distribute the shares. All unnecessary, cumbersome regulations that I don't add anything. And foreign investors, you see, you know, they see all these things. They have gone through all these things. They say, you know, look, if you want more money, you have to be incorporated outside. But he really has a, a, a he deals with it on a daily basis. Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you. My name is Dr. Jose Belines. I'm actually a, gra a Stanford graduate, an OBGYN. I was in private practice for 25 years. Right now, I'm the founder and CEO of, of Nimbus-T Global. We have a patented secure identity solution. Uh, we're also members of X9.org in Washington, D.C. The banking industry here in the U.S. is switching from SWIFT to ISO 222, which apparently is the standards being used in other parts of the world, so U.S. and Canada. And more recently, India is doing something really interesting in which the way that they're doing payments in the banking industry is, is like more advanced than what the U.S. is doing to the point where even people, like I was born in El Salvador. El Salvador has only 70% of the population doesn't have a bank account. And, and the president just made Bitcoin a national currency, right, which is kind of a little bit problematic. But in India, what's really amazing is even if you're poor, you can have a bank account and make transactions, and Visa is going to be like shoved out because you now have transactions that are um, essentially costless or at a very minimal cost. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? And again, we have a secure identity. It's going to play a it's dynamic encrypted multi-factor authentication. It's a dynamic ID into a QR code that will be used for identity uh, in the future, blockchain as well as banking. 
you know, I think you touched upon is here uh, a, a really, really powerful this thing innovation that has happened in India recently. It's called Universal Payment Interface. Uh, it's a non-profit developed that. Government of India mandated all the banks to implement that. So with the result, you see, even a smallest, if you want to spend, is, is send 10 cents to someone, you can instantly do on your phone, instantly. Mm -hmm. No cost to either party. Yeah. And uh, so my, my prediction is that like yoga and meditation, the, th the next big export out of idea, exported out of India would be this universal payment interface. Yeah. It's so amazingly successful. And has transformed, you see, the face of uh, the, you know, this not just payment thing, but now they're replicating that thing, that same experience in all the other areas, including language translation, including storing digital, uh, yep. uh, you know, all the records, as well as identity. It's incredible. Yep. Yeah. It's called UPI, UPI Universal, Universal Payment Interface. Go ahead. Your question? Sorry. Yeah. If you have UPI. Oh, then no, that's not. I don't think you can. U.S. phone, you can't do that. But if you have India, Indian phone, then you can do that. Yeah, within India, it works. Yeah. Outside, it's still regulatory challenges. Exactly. You still need to go through the FEMA rules. Uh, th thanks, guys. It was really amazing to, 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 to hear, hear you guys chatting. And my, my name is Vin. I, I have a few kids at Stanford to build their startups. And, and my passion and my interest is to uh, preserve wealth and intelligence at the developing countries. And, and my, my interest is to find solution and way so that you know, India or Southeast Asia countries uh, are re really finding ways to nurture up, but at the same time to preserve the wealth and then the intelligence community there. Uh, you know, you mentioned about the, the idea that, hey, Delaware, Singapore, and other countries, and then the roadmap for the exploitation has been there for like hundreds and thousands of years, right? So, so to really kind of like go against that kind of curtain, I think is, uh, is pretty, pretty tough. But at the same time, I think there's a gigantic values uh, for, for us to tackle that, uh, to level up. Because the idea that we, 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 we see uh, a, a potential little kid, and we can so easily hire them, or we can train them to become like us and partner up and win together. And, and that, that kind of notion, I think, is way higher values, uh, way difficult to, to, to do, but that is my, my, my passion and my interest, and I, I, I really would like to hear your thoughts on, on, on that kind of notion. I've spoken enough, I'll let these guys speak. Yes. Go ahead. I think uh, when it comes to that, uh, my answer is we are global citizens, not citizens of a country anymore. And most of the uh, companies that I work with, they actually think like that. For them, it's not they, are, they have to hire uh, a employee in Pakistan or India, they see capabilities, and then they say, where can I find the right capabilities? If I find a good manager in India, I'll build a team around that manager in India. If I find a good manager in Ukraine, I'll do the same in Ukraine. And that's the part that's interesting, that we are becoming, as, as corporate citizens, we are becoming more global citizens than a country focused, even though the capital may come from one place and the headquarters may be in one place, but most of these entrepreneurs are not restricting themselves to boundaries of a country. Great. Go ahead. Uh, I have a quick question for. Introduce I guess. yourself, please, if it's okay. It works. <laughs> Yeah. No, I think Tanvi made an interesting kind of uh, setup, right, in terms of the four pillars and how U.S.-India relationships, and I want to kind of spin it a little bit in terms of how you guys, particularly Wenk, you worked with India a lot, uh, particularly the government, right? Is India ready for a 10x growth, right, either from a strategic perspective or from economic technology perspective to really grow very fast, even if you wants India to grow because uh, 10, 15 years back, I think when there was this conversation with some of the hedge funds and other folks on Wall Street, China was ready. And, uh, and then I, I can see the results, right? 10, 15 years later, China is $20 trillion plus economy, whereas India is still struggling to be in, in, in that uh, early kind of startup block country, right? So is India ready for a 10x growth? 
I mean, if I can, if I can say, India is already there. I mean, I don't. I think uh, that I would. I, most of us are nodding as we're talking about. I mean, I know it's like a number. We just had our first Indian SaaS company go IPO, and there's already a list of like another 20, 30 in the works. Yes, the macro you know, put a pause on it, but it's just a matter of time, right? We just, I feel like now we're at the maturity stage. We're going to talk in the next panel a bit more on some of the data, uh, as Satya would go into, on why, why we think India is ready and why is now our time to collectively do kind of our, our work to kind of make that push happen. But that's just my two cents, but... Satya, we can take that. Uh, I, I'll give you a simple answer, which is necessity. It will happen. And the question is whether India is ready or not, things will work around it. So if, if it means that some of the entrepreneurs, as they become public, they'll have to move to other countries, they'll do that. I don't think anybody is thinking whether India is ready or not. The question is that there's a wave of uh, startups and companies from India that are either going to go public or IPOs in the next five, six years. And uh, wherever India can support, India will support. Otherwise, the whole globe is there to, for them to move and work around. Great. Yeah. Any final? Oh. Thank you, Priya. Um, first of all, I want to commend you uh, for incredible work uh, Vank, AGK, MR have done to promote cross-border investment. I mean, you know, you guys have really taken the bull by the horn. Uh, although it takes time for elephant to dance, but you started making it dance. Uh, <laughs> the ne <laughs> Absolutely. You know, actually, Naren was one of Correct. the first uh, fund, you see, to start in India. So, so true, so true. He's the godfather of all these things. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so next thing is investment goes where the growth is happening, right? And the growth requires startup to work, have their, you know, uh, whatever the product, services get piloted in a large companies or large, large setting. What we have seen is probably three, four, five hundred companies have set up their venture here, right? Uh, which helps the ecosystem, they invest in them, they provide the access to the data, access to you know, uh, their own uh, resources. Now, unfortunately, I don't see many from India coming here, one. And I don't know anybody going to India to set up their tech venture or, or venture. Although a lot of tech companies are coming from here, tech talent is coming from India. What can we do? to create a that level of relationship on the tech venture where corporates are connected on the both sides of it. So your question is why aren't many more corporate venture funds operating in India? Yeah. No, corporate venture funds are coming in Silicon Valley. From India? From world. world. Right? How can we not have them also go to India? That's right, that's right. Which, which will create opportunity for Indian startup and Indians to pilot their project, get investment, access to resources, and that will lead to suddenly, you know, humongous growth. Mm. Interesting question. I mean, Intel Ventures and Qualcomm Ventures yeah. and Microsoft uh, Ventures have been there, you see, for a while. No, no, venture also. No, yeah. the, the venture groups are, yeah, yeah they, they have been on there, but, but you're right. I mean, uh, it's an interesting question to ponder. I mm -hmm. don't know. I don't know the question. Or, or, or financial services and all those areas, I think. I, I, I don't think the C... Think about something along that line. Yeah. Mihir, I don't think the CDC is as mature uh, in India as in U.S. I think that's, that's a fair thing. There are obviously the corporate venture accelerators that have now kind of matured themselves into now more an investment arm, but there are very still nascent stages, not at the scale from here. But Qualcomm and folks obviously are continuing to now go deep there. Proc I know Procter & Gamble from here are actively looking into the India market, and you're starting to see more of those looking into but not set up a full-fledged shop yet. Right. Yeah, I think it's a lo lot of them actually do have corp dev people or venture uh, team members who are focused on India. And they may be sitting in Singapore or somewhere else, but they do have now people who are saying India is an important market. They still don't have an office there just because they may not need the critical mass of people or may not have the critical mass of people to put there. It, but you know, it's an interesting point. Uh, sorry. I mean, AGK, I think maybe Thai should do something. Lead a delegation of these corporate ventures to, to India and expose them to that. We, we had a part of the Thai Global uh, Connect that we had, that we had a specific session on uh, 
Yeah. Asia society can also. No, I think it's an excellent idea. That's a great point, yeah. for sure. Yeah, no, I I'm just saying it's a question of time and maturity. Look, why are everybody coming to Silicon Valley? Because where the tech hub is, every sort of digitally forward company who wants to re, you know, redo their businesses, manufacturing, you know, whatever, whatever the hundred-year-old companies all want to set up here, it's just a question of time. You're going to see in five to ten years, you know, fifty percent of the IPOs are going to be Indian companies. Then everything will change. That's right. Any final question? Yes. Uh, thank you. This was great. Um, I had a question to kind of to follow up on some of the discussion in terms of governments as enablers or obstacles. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, Satya that uh, India is of the BRIC countries the one that's attractive. The theory of the case for India has also been on the kind of non-capital uh, side, but in trade and investment, um, that because other countries are, are looking to diversify or at least have China plus one strategies, that India would be the natural place to go. But what we're seeing there is it's not necessarily the natural place to go unless you want to do business in India. Otherwise, a Vietnam might be more attractive. Uh, you could see kind of Indonesia sometimes be more attractive for firms, so kind of on the non-capital side. But one of the things that's helping start is a discussion within the Indian government about what India needs to do to make sure it is that choice that countries make. Um, so in terms of kind of for each of you, if you had the Indian, you know, the, in an ideal world, what would you have, one or two or three things that you'd like the Indian government to do uh, that would make it a more attractive place for whether it's that capital to go uh, or, you know, for, uh, for startups to not have to move to kind of the Singapore's or Delaware's of this world. No offense to Delaware um, and the great state of Delaware. But, you know, what could, what could make India or that when, when somebody's making that choice that could actually uh, change their minds about India? Okay. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, you know, in India, most of the policy things are driven by bureaucrats. And bureaucrats, you see, work in silos. So, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, Ministry of the, the Central Board of Direct Taxes, and then there is Ministry of Finance and all of those things. And each one is trained to basically optimize for their own interests. And I really wish that there was an over sort of a, some task force that was created, you know, interdepartmental task force led by some powerful, some person who has ears of prime minister. And the decisions of the task force are not Again, you see, debated internally on different groups, but they are just implemented. So today the situation is that in general, you see, bureaucrats, you see, are, you know, bureaucrats who rise to the top in generally are honest people, they are hardworking people, they want the good of the country, but each one is, is sub-optimizing because they don't have the bigger picture that our goal should be to make it the most desirable, you see, manufacturing destination in the world. And so some policy initiative in one department is completely neutralized by some stupid regulation in somewhere else. And not because the intention is to do that, it's just that the mechanism does not exist. So this interdepartmental sort of task force thing, and you know, this is an unending thing. So, uh, so you may set up, you see, one for one particular thing, but then the next one you'll have the exact same issue again. So, if I were to wish something, it would be that at least for uh, at least for two or three strategically important ones, the prime ministers, someone see who has prime ministers, you see, access, is heads up the task force that cuts across all these things and comes up with a list of things that need to be done, and they get done, not debated again in those di different departments. So it's a very technocratic answer, but I think uh, that's what is needed to done. Thank you. We're right at time. So let's give a round of applause. Thank you all. Thank you.